Our next speaker is going to look at the issue from a medical point of view. His name is Dr. James Dahlgren. He's in private practice in internal medicine and occupational and environmental medicine in Santa Monica and is co-chair of Heavy Metal Subcommittee of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Science. He is a lecturer at UCLA School of Medicine and UCLA School of Public Health. Welcome, Dr. Dahlgren. Good morning, good morning everyone. I, uh, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Um, it's a big topic. The health effects of living near an oil field. And I'd like to just introduce my thinking that the issue here is not just fracking, but it's having individuals living in houses a few yards from an oil field. Next slide. There are 1,475 actual wells in the Englewood field. Of those, there are 469 that are actively producing oil and gas, and 168 are injection wells. The other wells, the ones that they drilled in the past, those are abandoned wells and create a conduit for the vapors in the oil field to come to the surface. They need to be properly closed. As it was alluded to earlier, there has been really no effort to look at those old wells and see how leaky they are. Next slide. This is from Dogger, the oil and gas production from this uh, oil field. And I draw your attention to the red spike near the uh, right-hand side of the graph. That was in 2006. And what that probably indicated was that they began stimulating the wells. Now, fracking is a one of the methods of stimulating a well. Uh, Dr. Tom referred to other fracking techniques that aren't really fracking. They're called well stimulation techniques. And when that red peak occurred, I suspect that that's when people in the neighborhood began smelling more odors and experiencing more health problems. And as you can see, the overall effect of the passage of time since back in the 90s is that these, this field has been producing more and more oil and gas. And that's the only one way that could be done is that by stimulating the wells, and that would include uh, fracking. I would like to e emphasize again that we're not just talking about fracking here. We're talking about an oil field that puts off uh, vapors and also uh, disturbs the ground underneath. Next slide. This was a picture you also saw a minute ago of what the fracking business looks like. To me, it's scary seeing all those trucks. I, I'm, I, frack, frankly, I think it just seems like it's something that shouldn't be done. Next slide. Dangerous chemicals that are generated from uh, a, an oil field, any oil field, but ones which are increased greatly if there is fracking going on. Number one on my list is benzene and we're going to talk more about that. Of course, methane, we've already heard how that can be a very dangerous chemical from the standpoint of explosion and fire. H2S, which most of you are familiar with, hydrogen sulfide, that's what you smell frequently from the field. Uh, glycol ethers is another super toxic chemical that causes reproductive harm and is part of the fracking fluids, and it happens to be one of the high volume chemicals used in the fracking process. And hexane is a oil field chemical, but it's also heavily used and added in the fracking fluid. Happens to be one of the most toxic neurotoxins. That is a chemical that damages the nerves, not only in the peripheral arms and legs, but in the brain. And then there are many others. Next slide. Paul mentioned all of the health effects. I'm sorry that the, you can't quite see the number of uh, health effects, but there are health effects of almost every chemical in the mix that is used in fracking causes skin, nose, and eye irritation. It's 95% of the chemicals that are present in this environment 
damage the mucous membranes and affect the respiratory tract, which is the next one up, which is 90%, actually damage the lung, causing things like asthma, pneumonia, bronchitis, and as we go up the list, we get up near the top, almost half of the chemicals are known to cause cancer, at least in animal studies, and many of them in human studies. Next slide. This is a, a slide from Pennsylvania, where they looked at what were the chemicals coming off in the air plume next to the field that was being fracked. Next. Got stuck again. <laughs> they got fracked. They got fracked. Anyway, we uh, we'll see a slide in a minute that talks about the increase in benzene. Yes, on the right, on the left side, we have the benzene measurements before fracking in the air in the neighborhood around the well, up to a few hundred yards. The next. Next on the right-hand side is the same studies in the same location after fracking. And what it represents is a 12-fold increase in the concentration in the air of benzene, going from basically one part per billion and averaging something in the range of 10 to 15 to 20 parts per billion. Um, at some times it was much higher, almost 100 parts per billion, using 24-hour measurements, but this represents 95% of the measurements were uh, at 20 parts per billion. Yes? Was that the New Jersey study? This was a Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania study. The McKenzie is the author. Another quick question. That higher number, does that put humans at risk at the higher level? That's the next slide. We're going to go through a series of studies that have been done in the last few years. This one is also from uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Department of Health did a study of a gasoline spill in one of the neighborhoods uh, in Pennsylvania. And they studied the health effects from that gasoline spill, and they measured benzene levels in the neighborhood. They found a fourfold increase in leukemia in the first study, and the average exposure of those individuals who developed the leukemia was 30 parts per billion years. Well, that means one part per billion for 30 years, or five parts per billion for, uh, per billion for six years. Or if you're at 20 parts per billion, you're almost there with one year. In other words, a very low level of exposure to this chemical in the real world, in Pennsylvania, caused people to get cancer. That was 2009, 2011, a follow-up study from the Department of Health confirmed the increasing number of additional leukemias in the neighborhood. Next slide. This is a study from Sweden uh, where they looked at a neighborhood next to a, a re oil refinery. Now in Sweden, they have tougher laws than we have here. And that refinery was putting out very low levels, usually well under five parts per billion, usually less than one part per billion of benzene in the neighborhood. And they didn't expect to find anything, because if you look at some of the medical literature, it would indicate that that level does not cause a health effect. Well, guess what? They found an increase in leukemia rates, again, fourfold increase in the neighborhood. They really almost couldn't believe their results. And the comment, which you may not be able to read, is low-level benzene exposure may pose a higher risk than was previously believed. Next slide. This is a study from Australia, sponsored by the Australian Petroleum Institute. The industry was studying its own workers, and they were looking at workers in refineries. And again, they were looking at benzene and leukemia. They found at the lowest level that they could measure, which happened to be uh, one to two parts per billion year, or part per million, pardon me, uh, they had an increase but that was their control group. Then they looked at the people at two to four part per million years, which is very low levels, by the way, compared to you know, what we used to think was a safe level. And they found there was no threshold 
that no matter how low the exposure was, there was an increase in leukemia in the petroleum workers Five in minutes. Australia. Next slide. This is another industry study in Norway where they looked at workers that were on um, ships that were sh transporting oil. And again, the levels were in the low parts per billion, five parts, one part, 10 part per billion in the air, very low levels. And again, Dr. Kirkland couldn't believe his data and said again, we realize that there must be an effect at a much lower level than was previously believed. Next slide. Study from China, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, found the same thing. Below one part per million, at 240 parts per billion, 0.24 ppm, they were finding acute effects, damage to the bone marrow, and again, they couldn't find a threshold. And this damage to the bone marrow is a precursor to the leukemias and the other cancers that arise in the bone marrow, such as lymphoma. They found also something very interesting, which we won't go into in great detail, but they actually identified what it was that made some people more susceptible to getting leukemia from benzene. There are among us about 15 to 20 percent of the population who experience far greater impact from the low level of benzene. So we have to do our studies over again and identify those extra, extra sensitive people. Next slide. Next. This is just from that same study of the Chinese uh, workers uh, showing the effect of the susceptibility factor. Next slide. This is a, a study of uh, asthma that was done. Uh, it turns out that there are at least dozens of studies linking benzene in the air at low parts per billion range, that is in the general background population in the cities around the United States and around the world. And this is a, a summation of a number of studies, and all of them, with one exception, were showing very high increased rates of asthma from low level exposure to benzene. And I suspect that's one health effect that we will be seeing in the population if we ever get a chance to study uh, living near the Englewood oil field. Next slide. Methane has to be mentioned. Obviously, it's an extremely dangerous uh, chemical. As far as we know, it doesn't have very much in the way of uh, the chronic low-level toxic effects such as benzene, but it's very dangerous. And in fact, the oil company had a study done and they found as high as 3,627 parts per million in the soil gas in the field where they were testing. That's only a few, you know, 1,000, maybe uh, 1,400 parts per million from the lowest explosive level. Obviously, there is a great danger in this oil field of explosion and fire. Uh, and that alone should be a reason that it not be in the middle of a neighborhood. Next slide. H2S has been mentioned. Is H2S dangerous? Well, the answer to that is yes. It has chronic, low-level toxic effects, primarily to the brain. A number of studies have been done near oil refineries and other H2S sources showing that even in the low parts per billion, it can cause brain damage, particularly in children. It has an interesting effect on the mitochondria of the, inside the cell, which is why it's so toxic. And there's a cumulative effect similar to benzene. And again, undoubtedly, so some people are more susceptible. Uh, it's also a respiratory irritant. It goes on that list of one of the chemicals out of the, out of the uh, field, which would cause damage to your lung, your nose, your sinuses, and so forth. Birth defects have been linked to the oil chemicals. Um, I list a number of papers there. We won't get into great detail. But again, what our most susceptible people living in an oil field community are the unborn children in utero. And they are subject to not only the birth defects, but also childhood leukemia, which has been documented in Los Angeles County next to the oil refineries in Wilmington. Next slide. I want to mention before we end, vapor intrusion to me is one of the unstudied and un seems to be many people don't know about it, but when they have this huge number of wells completely 
filling up the community around the uh, uh, oil field, there's going to be leakage of vapor into the soil, and it will find its way to the surface one way or the other. That's the natural thing that vapor does. Time, Dr. Lundgren. Soon as it reaches the, next slide please, it shows this very school, since it has wells under it, probably has some vapor intrusion. And we need to look into how much of it is actually getting into our homes and into our uh, schools, churches, everywhere. Next slide. What we need to do, this is sort of my recommendation, and I think there's a handout that outlines in more detail what I'm suggesting we do now. Uh, we need to do a, a survey of the neighborhood, and we need to measure for benzene metabolites, because at very low levels, even down at that one part per billion range, we can identify uh, an, a, a, a metabolite that occurs in the urine and is specific for benzene. And that's, I'll stop there for, for Thank now. Thank you very much.